the largest destroyer in the world with the highest cost. The ship that applied the best technological solutions and faced many problems. The brainchild of an ambitious military program on the verge of collapse. Today we meet the ships that may become the beginning of a new era in the naval history or one of the most expensive failures in the history of shipbuilding. The Zumwalt class is a representative of a new generation of guided missile destroyers, incorporating both the best solutions already usual in the Navy and completely new ones. This made them the most advanced, complex and expensive destroyers in the world. The history of these new ships originates from several big questions that were bothering the US military since the late 1980s. The first question was the need to increase the efficiency and survivability of warships in the event of a large-scale battle. The Cold War wasn't over yet. The concept involved the creation of rather large vessels, with effective protection and high automation. As armament it was supposed to use both missiles and standard weapons as well as lasers and magnetic guns. The complete set. The concept was quite popular but lost relevance in the 1990s. After the end of the Cold War the need for such ships disappeared. The work continued but more like in a purely scientific format. The second question attracted widespread attention as early as the 1990s. This was the time of resignation of the main naval legends of the 20th century battleships. The debate on the battleship retirement raised a problem that at first glance was not important. There was no replacement for their guns in the fleet. For some people that wasn't a concern. Missiles and naval aviation could handle this job well. But others countered that aviation and missiles are often too expensive and are not able to completely replace naval artillery. In the late 90s a number of projects on these topics were put together in a program called DD-21. It envisioned the creation of a new generation of large destroyers which would combine both the effectiveness of the original concept of future ships and the introduction of the newest long-range guns and other solutions that would allow them to replace battleships. Such goal setting by the way became one of the nuances of obtaining the index of these destroyers. While the names of Arleigh Burke class destroyers begin with the DDG-51 and now reach the declared DDG-138. The new generation ships will continue the tradition of mainly the Spruance class destroyers, the last of which carried the index DDG-997. The lead ship of the new generation will receive the DDG-1000 index, continuing the tradition and sounding spectacular. In the years 2000-2001 the project received official approval and at the same time it was announced that the lead ship of the new generation will be named in honor of Admiral Elmo Zumwalt. Initially the Navy was supposed to receive 32 ships of this type. But it quickly became clear that the project, which implies the introduction of a huge number of innovations, does not fit into the budget. And this figure had to be reduced to 24 and then to 7. Meanwhile the disputes over the budget continued. With ever increasing complexity and cost, Congress ultimately provided funding for the construction of just 3 ships as technology demonstrators. The rest of the budget went to purchase a batch of Arleigh Burke destroyers. They were already available and proved to be quite good. Naturally, a sharp reduction in production plan led to an equally sharp increase in the cost of each ship, produced not in a series but one by one. It was assumed that the lead DDG-1000 would cost 3.5 billion dollars, a huge figure for a destroyer. The calculation of the total budget showed that the cost of the entire program, including research, development and construction of ships, will exceed 20 billion. General Dynamics was chosen as the main subcontractor and in addition to them, other large companies participated in the program. Northrop Grumman, Raytheon, BAE Systems, Lockheed Martin and so on. Finally, in 2011, the keel of the DDG-1000 Zumwalt was laid at the General Dynamics Beth Iron Works shipyard in Maine. The keel of the second ship, DDG-1001 Michael Mansour, was laid in 2013 and the assembly of the DDG-1002 Lyndon B. Johnson began in 2017. By 2019 all three ships are already sailing, although still taking on the thorny path of testing. So. What did the fleet get for its rather big investment? Zumwalt class ships have a length of 610 feet or 190 meters and a displacement of almost 16,000 tons. 
in those indicators is significantly exceeds hourly berg, the displacement of which reaches 9800 tons, and automatically becomes the heaviest of this type of ships made in the United States. Among the analogs worldwide, it is second only to the Russian Orlan or Kirov class nuclear flagships. The first thing that catches the eye is of course the rather exotic appearance of the ship that immediately says it is stealth. I have to note that reducing radar visibility is already quite a normal practice in the new warship's design, but in the Zomwald program this task was one of the main ones. A faceted shape with a minimum number of parts, most of the equipment is hidden inside the structure and the surface itself has special radar absorbing coatings. The same goal was pursued in the design of the power plant. Its core is a pair of Rolls-Royce MT-30 gas turbine generators with a power of 35.4 megawatts each. They generate electricity for all the ship's systems. This is one of the special features. The ship is almost completely electric, including engines. The use of this kind of power plant introduces certain technical risks and leads to the rise of the project cost, but on the other hand, this solution makes it more compact and, what is also important, quiet. Along with additional vibration absorbing elements and new cooling systems, it reduces the ship's infrared signature and by noise it is at the level of modern submarines. The ship doesn't become invisible of course, but in disguise it achieved serious results. Despite the fact that Zumwalt class ships themselves are very large, their radar cross section or roughly speaking their visibility on radars does not exceed that of a small civilian vessel, yacht or a fishing boat, whereas classic destroyers glow like Christmas trees. This sometimes becomes a problem. When performing standard voyages, the ship has to be equipped with special reflectors so that it becomes visible again. It would be a shame to find out that the most expensive destroyer in the navy almost sank because due to its disguise someone crashed into it. Of course, the widespread of stealth technology is not only controversial in terms of traffic. It's not a submarine. Is there even a point in making the ship of this size invisible on radars if it potentially will be used in coastal areas with active sea traffic when it will be observed visually? In addition, all the excellent solutions to ensure stealth lose all meaning at the moment it opens fire. This means that its survivability will be at maximum while sailing, but on direct participation in military operations it will not have significant advantages over its classic colleagues. The ship is capable of accelerating to a speed of 30 knots and its total energy capacity significantly exceeds this indicator on similar vessels. This is done mainly for the future, to power new types of weapons, laser and magnetic, that may be installed later. In terms of appearance and controllability, many people can have the idea that a ship with such a huge tumble home suffers from instability and on a sharp turn may even roll over. The Zumwalt class has many problems, but instability is not one of them. During the sea trials they showed themselves pretty good. And looking back, we can point out much more extreme designs, starting with Japanese battleships with huge towers on decks and ending for example with the USS Long Beach cruiser with its frightening appearance which did not stop it from serving at sea for decades without any problems. Of course, given the requirements to provide artillery support for coastal forces, the ship had to get new guns. Replacing the giant main calibers that the battleships were so proud of was not an easy task. Initially, as part of the DD-21 project, it was planned to create the VGAS system, vertical gun for advanced ships, with a vertically located barrel firing guided projectiles. But such a design was too complicated and the engineers had to return to the more classic 155mm turret gun design. But not without innovations. It fires specially designed long range land attack projectiles or the LR LAP. These are in fact guided missiles, fired by a gun and supported in flight by jet thrust. Given that each ship is equipped with two of those guns, it's safe to say that Zumwalt has surpassed its mighty ancestors. But the problem, again, was in the money. The cost of LR Lab reaches million dollars a piece, so only these three destroyers were equipped with them. The manufacturers are trying to create something more acceptable based on the LR Lab technology. Their work is underway, it is assumed that the future ships will be equipped with electromagnetic guns. And we can't forget about the little things. The main caliber is good for artillery strikes, but for protection from small ships and boat attacks, Zumwalt received a 30mm MK-46 gun. 
Of course, new tasks do not cancel the old ones. Zumwalt, like its predecessors, is equipped with a set of vertical missile launch systems. However, unlike the analogs, these weapons are not assembled in a special zone on the ship, but distributed along its sides, which reduces the risk of explosion of ammunition in the event of an attack, and even if it does, the damage will be reduced. The idea potentially increases survivability of the ship, but again, complicates the design and reduces the armament. While Arle Burke carries up to 96 missiles, the seemingly larger Zumwalt only 80. The ship may contain additional transport, marine and aerial. The aft deck has a large landing area with a hangar that can accommodate two helicopters. At the bottom, there is an internal dock for accommodation of boats. The rest of the filling is also almost at the highest level. Initially, it was assumed that Zumwalt will be equipped with several active electronically scanned array radar stations, operating in different wavelength ranges in parallel. But later, it was decided that radars so powerful and complex were just too much, and to save money, they were simplified. However, this option is still considered the most advanced, and is planned for installation on other new warships. To complete the task of underwater observation, the ship was equipped with a complex of sonars, capable of effectively tracking mines, submarines and everything that comes with them. In order to fight them, the ship is equipped with anti-submarine missiles and helicopters. There are no torpedo tubes. Zumwalt is almost a robot. Most of the weapons, onboard systems and elements of the power plant are controlled by computers with minimal human involvement. As a result, this is a huge empty ship. Its entire crew is 130, 150 people. For example, twice as many people serve on smaller Arle Berg destroyers. This number of innovations, including the introduction of technologies created from scratch, could not come without problems. And there is a lot of them in all directions, from software to generators. The main problem, of course, was the monstrous cost. According to general data, the Zumwalt program cost the budget $22.5 billion, and the construction of each ship, not counting R&D, cost about $4 billion, and these figures are not final at all. The main reason for the success in the initial budget is probably the excessive ambition of its executors. The military and the industry tried to introduce everything in one ship. The ship's functions are significantly revised compared to those on conventional destroyers, which increased the risks. In addition, a huge number of completely new technologies, which required large-scale research at the beginning and now cause problems due to shortcomings, have increased the risks even more. At the same time, all these features, although they make the Zumwalt destroyers the most advanced, don't really give any undeniable advantages over the existing ships, which perform their tasks quite well and cost a lot less. As a result, instead of a serious fleet group, the Navy received only three vessels that still need to be brought to real combat readiness, and the military are forced to continue purchasing and modernization of old ships and to develop new projects. Can Zumwalt, in this case, be considered a colossal failure? Well, if you look at them as just new destroyers, then yes, spending $22 billion on three ships is crazy. They could build a fleet of simpler ships instead. But if you look at everything as a research program with three prototypes, it will still be an inadequately expensive program. But it must be taken into account that the number of technologies created for it is huge, and the ships are now acting as labs, working out promising solutions that would otherwise be very difficult to implement. Zumwalt was born in agony, devouring time, effort and money, and it never became the next generation of future warships. But the created potential is huge, and in one form or another, will definitely be implemented on other projects, one of which finally will become the new generation that everyone has been waiting for a long time. Meanwhile, the story of this epic trinity continues, unlike today's video. Comment what you think about the prospects of these sea monsters, and be sure to subscribe to the channel. There's a lot of interesting things on the horizon.